Hey guys, it's Caleb Williams here, and I just wanted to do an introduction for Philip Stutz um, before our interview. Uh, if you watch our show, you know that uh, many times I'll go right into the interview. I want to do my very best to to show behind the scenes, be authentic, and I think there's a lot that we can learn from that. Uh, with this interview, I wanted to give you context, give you a trigger warning, and and potentially tell you that on certain platforms like YouTube, it might be taken down based on some of the things that we talked about. Philip Stutz uh, got introduced uh, to me by a friend and has a lot of history working in the political field. He's helped uh, three p uh, presidential candidates um, win, uh, including uh, former President Donald Trump. And, and then he's also been involved in 1,433 um, election victories. Um, these are not just elections that he's been involved in. He's been involved in 1,433 election victories. Um, he's written a couple uh, best-selling books, one that we talked about um, and, and what helped Donald Trump get elected and then ultimately how that can translate into our life. The reason I'm giving a trigger warning is um, Philip uses uh, some swear words that in many cases I, I bleep out and, and I'm not going to do it for this, for this episode. Um, and then the other thing is he talks about some um, uh, political views, view, viewpoints about politics, about COVID, about restrictions, um, all the things that um, some people very much would get triggered by. And I know that you're following Better Wealth. And in, in many cases, I'm staying really neutral, getting people on that are talking about uh, your money and living intentionally. And, and while I think politics are important for us to follow, I don't want to get, this is not a political show. And so I just want to share that with you because as uh, an interviewer, I love hearing different opinions. I love that. And you're going to hear me dialogue with him. Uh, but but I'm also 100% open to having uh, people on both sides of the aisle. I think one thing that I, if I could summarize my beliefs is I think we need to continue conversations and we cannot cancel conversations. I think uh, the moment conversations that are, are polarizing are canceled, that's when um, negative things happen. And hence, why I'm why I think a lot differently about money is I learned that because uh, of of the freedom of learning and hearing what people thought even though they may be wrong or it might not be popular and so without further ado um, I want to just tee up this conversation and and just know that I'm grateful so grateful to have the conversation with Philip I hope that um, if you listen to this that you gain a lot and then I would love to hear from you whether it's in the comments of YouTube or whether it's just reaching out to to me personally, I would love to hear what some of your biggest takeaways are. I would also like to hear um, if you think it's wise that we're bringing some people on that might have different um, political views viewpoints. Um, I, I really want to best serve our audience, and and as a result, I I listen to every single comment and every single email and message that we get because uh, what we're going to do in 2022, we're going to double down on our content and be way more active because I realize that this is the platform that can have tremendous, tremendous impact if we do that right. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Philip Stutz. What was really interesting is when we got connected, I started doing some research because you, you're up to some incredible things on the marketing side. I, I know we could talk about investments all day long. Sure. Um, you're, you have some very strong and I think um, potential accurate views as it relates to politics. And obviously, you've had your hand in a lot of a lot of winning. And what I've seen in just doing research on you is you have really correlated this concept of like, hey, this is what's happening in polit like helping politicians win. And this is how it can transfer into helping your business win or you personally win. What right. what I'm curious about is I want to know you. I want to know your story. I want to know mm -hmm. like what what made you want to get into politics. Um, no filters, and I already appreciate your like let's let's be accurate from the get go. Yeah, you don't I'm need just, to qualify. Just ask. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm just more curious about your backstory yeah. and just and just who you are. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, and I grew up and I was one of the first, I was probably the first generation of diagnosed ADD kids. So um, it there wasn't even the H and the ADHD. There was no ADHD, it was just ADD. We didn't have hyperactivity. We just were all attention deficit disorder kids. And in the 80s, I was put on Ritalin. Um, because that's what the doctor said that this, you know, kid that couldn't pay attention in class. And 
um, you know, I've, I've come to realize that my ADD is, can be, a, can be utilized as a superpower or it could be something that's, you know, devastating, right? In school, it was devastating. I, I mean, I'm a, ter- I was a terrible student. I struggled every, you know, everything, I, every grade I went to college, everything. And ultimately I came to the decision when I was about 22 years old, that I was only going to be able to do a career or a profession that I was super passionate about. That if, you know, I remember my friends that were like getting, going to job banks at the, I went to the University of Alabama and they were going to job banks and it was like, Hey, you can sell, um, trucking beds and be a salesperson you can start out make you know back in like 1996 1997 they're like you can start out making thirty seven thousand dollars a year i mean that was insane and i'm like trucking beds like, who in the hell wants to sell truck like i could i think i'd throw up if i was trying to sell that i, I don't believe in that not that there's anything wrong with it it's just not for me and really i only cared about two things going up and that was college football and politics and i didn't care about like what the policies were. Um, I I didn't care about environmental policy or tax policy. No, 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 no. I was always fascinated by how people got elected into office. Mm. And, um, and I feel like I had sort of a common sense background, which made me more conservative. Um, And you, you learned this probably too, Caleb, but just in the um, being part of the uh, turning point and all that is like the, you're the least popular person when you come out as a conservative at, at any young age. Like, the, the, and, and you're even more unpopular these days, right? Like, right. You, you have to be a contrarian if you're in college and you know, you decide, you know, my politics are conservative, right? And but I was super passionate about it, and I wasn't going to be a college football player. I was, um, I'm, I'm five nine, about 150 pounds, so that wasn't going to happen. So I just said, you know what, I'm gonna, I want to go work on those political campaigns. I saw the Republican Revolution in 1994, um, and wrote a lot of papers on it and got horrible grades from my liberal teachers, and then said, you know, I, I think this is what I want to do. And um, ran out and worked on my first presidential campaign, which was Bob Dole against uh, against Bill Clinton. That was a, a loser, but I can tell you, I, I I I caught the bug, and the bug is just super passionate, right? And so from about two thousand to 2002, so over a three year period, 2000, 2001, 2002, I had 20 days off total in three years. Um, mm-hmm. being working on campaigns. I was working on the Bush uh, election, presidential election that I worked on in 2000. That was in you know, 2000, 2001. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I went to work for the Department of Education as a presidential appointee. And then I moved to South Dakota and I was run, helping run John Thune's U.S. Senate race. And then I moved to Louisiana and I became the campaign manager for eventual governor, Bobby Jindal. Um, and again, 20 something days off in three years. And that was because I was super passionate about what I was doing. I was helping candidates get elected and change the, the course of the country, especially during a time of war. And I just felt like uh, that was my duty. And, and so that was sort of how it worked. And then I ended up working for the reelection campaign for President Bush in 2004. I was the national get out the vote director. And in, in that, that sort of sort of was the foundation for what I do today, which is I learned in that campaign, the campaign manager at the time was a guy named Ken Melman. He handed out books to everybody, uh, all the senior team members, and it was Moneyball by uh, Michael Lewis. And he said, I want everybody to read this because this campaign is going to be run like Moneyball. And I even today I talk about this, um, the, the business owners we work with, the businesses we work with and the politicians we work with. We, we are Moneyball marketers. We run on data um, and we have a systematic formula that we run all our campaigns on. It's data backed and everything we do. And it really started in that first election in 2004, where uh, the political marketing world was upended by what we did on that campaign. It changed politics forever. And it was the most historic behind the scenes political marketing campaign in history. And no one really knows about it. And so I, in my book, The Undefeated Marketing System, I decided, well, I'm going to tell a story. And so I told that story and I told about how from 2004, we, we established the most innovative campaign, political campaign in modern political history. And then Obama took our model and then added social media on top of that. And he created his campaign, created the most 
uh, innovative marketing campaign in American history until 2016 when Trump came in and he married branding, make America great again, to social media, to the data that we kind of used in 2004, he married all three. And then that became the most innovative campaign in, in American history, uh, political marketing campaign in American history. And uh, I even go on to say, that the formula that the all these candidates used and that I've used in every political campaign since 2004, um, Joe Biden used the exact same formula in 2020. And except I do not believe he has the most innovative marketing campaign in the history of American politics because they basically put him in the basement and they hit him for six months. They knew that would win the election. Um, so that was the winning strategy, but it was nothing innovative. Yeah. Anyway, that's a long story about my background, but that's kind of how we came today. And about five years ago, Caleb, uh, I hit, you know, I was uh, in my early 40s and I basically said, you know, I've been doing the same thing for 20 something years now and I need a new challenge. And I've always been fascinated that the way we elect politicians could help business owners, could help investors um, in in the way that they look at how they how they look at whether it's uh you know, let's just say it's um, uh, stockbrokers or financial um, investment advisors. Like I, I felt like we could help those businesses grow um, just like I could help a business owner grow if they followed the formula, the secret formula that we use to elect presidents. And I started working. Uh, I, I had a couple business owners that were that, that wanted to be the guinea pigs. And over time, we perfected the formula now to where by utilizing this marketing formula that we have, uh, we've grown. We grow every. We've grown every business we've ever worked with, and um, I, it's so much so that a couple of years ago I screamed, "This this damn thing is undefeated!" And I went, "Ooh, that's the name of it." And so I named it the Undefeated Marketing System, and that's the name of the book. And then the subtitle of the book is "How to Grow Your Business and Build Your Audience Using the Secret Formula That Elects Presidents," and um, and that's kind of where we are today. And I and I saw that you experienced a little bit of um, censorship. Uh, are, is it still? Is your book still censored on some social media platforms, or has all of that kind of gone away? No, it, we fought back and won. So um, in in uh, January of 2021, um, we, were, we were I was waiting. At, my book came out in, in April of 21, and we had the we had a couple of different book covers. And we decided, let's go run uh, an A-B test on Facebook and throw all three of the top voting, uh, the, the top book covers that we had and, and see, you know, who clicked on the most. So we decided we were going to put like $1,000 behind three book covers and then see, you know, between my ideal marketplace, which yeah. cover got the most clicks. And Facebook shut the ads down and, and banned my book and said, because the, in the subtitle of my book, it said, you know, how to grow your business and build your audience using the secret formula that elects presidents. And so they said that that was trying to influence an election. Now, this was January of 2021. There was no election. And I wrote a business book that has, it's not a political uh, marketing book to help politicians. To, it's a business book uh, with an outlier strategy for business owners and, uh, you know, the like. Anyway, didn't matter. They, they, we appealed, they denied the appeal. So I decided because I have a platform, I was going to fight back. Um, I wrote an article um, in, uh, oh God, now I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the, I wrote a national article in a, in, a, in, in basically laid out the story. I also told in this article um, that just, Justin Donald had similar issues, someone that you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, his book, because he had mentioned the word words COVID-19 in his book, Amazon told him he wasn't allowed to sell on their platform unless he removed them. He said, I'm utilizing COVID, I'm talking about COVID-19 and how people invested during the pandemic and they said they didn't care. And so he had to remove them from his book, uh, The Lifestyle Investor, and, yep. you know, it just crazy story. So I decided to write an article about my story, their stories. There was a nonprofit that was helping sexually and physically abused kids. Um, their ads were taken down by Facebook because they said they were trying to influence an election. They're a nonprofit trying to save children from sexual and physical abuse. So I told those stories and then I got, I got on Fox news, uh, Fox news did a whole story. I did a big interview on it. And the next thing I know, 
Facebook, uh, about a week later, Facebook came out and uh, lifted all the, all the bands. So that, that, I feel like I had a small victory, but it really, I didn't win a war. I just won a battle. Yeah. The war is still going. It, this is, this is going to be like a, un, unlike any other podcast that I do, because you've just opened up a whole can of worms yeah. with me, like from a just curiosity standpoint. So sure. if, if you're triggered about politics, I would just leave right now. But if you're wanting to uh, just create an undefeated marketing campaign, learn more about that, learn more just about why you believe what you believe. I have so many questions about Donald Trump and some of the things that made him successful, maybe some of the things that worked against him. One of my just fundamental questions is why the Republican Party? You said, you know, football, you were, you, it sounded like you went to school down south. Was it just one of those things where it's just like common sense for you? And then it sounds like to work on Donald Trump um, as president, like that would have been super controversial. So like, talk to me about the, the values that you, that got you into that um, party. And then why are you still a, a strong advocate for the con conservative movement? Um, the honest answer is in high school, I started listening to Rush Limbaugh and I was highly entertained and I felt like common sense was where I, my, I land politically. I still do. That may not be as aligned in the Republican party as it, as it used to be, but that's where it was back then in the late eighties, early nineties. And then I saw this, the, the contract with America and the revolution of the Republicans in 1994. I read the contract with America. I wrote papers that in college on the contract with America. And I felt like it was common sense. It's about hard work. It's about not punishing businesses. It's all these things. And although I was just a student, it just kind of made sense to me. Um, my politics have definitely evolved over the years. I'm much more libertarian now. Um, and, but I feel like the vast majority of Americans are probably aligned with where I think um, and not with a political party one way or the other. I think we're, we're driven into tribes by, by yeah. what's going on with whether it's COVID or, you know, anti-Trump, pro-Trump, all that stuff. And I'm really not either. Um, I'm, I'm about, um, I want people out of my lives. <laughs> I don't care if it's the government. I, I don't care if yeah. it's like an annoying person. I don't want anybody that's annoying me in my life. And, um, here's the thing when, um, when something goes wrong, I don't bitch and complain. I just go work and try to fix it. And I just put my head down. And I think um, we are an entitled society that doesn't know how to cope. They have horrible coping mechanisms. I, I struggle with my own right, in my own ways. I struggle with communication. I'm like a, one of the, you know, internally, I struggle in how I communicate with others because I just think people should get it and, and instead yeah. of learning and teaching better. But, you know, where I know I'm right is that when you see a problem, you solve it and you don't sit there and bitch and complain. You just go to work and you fix it. And, you know, people today, they see something and they, they throw up their arms and go, oh, that's not fair. That's not right. And then they just quit. And that's just an anathema to me. I just don't, I don't, it doesn't register in my brain. And I'm more aligned with a political party, I guess, that, says get to work and you know you're you're not going to be penalized for doing the right things oh, look i'll even i'll tell you about covid um right now with covid i have no like again i'm more libertarian if you want to go get the vaccine go get the vaccine if you don't want to get the vaccine don't get the vaccine it spreads regardless so who cares if you're don't want to get it and you get it and it kills you that's on you if you want to get it you get the vaccine and you get covid and it saves your life good that's for you whatever it is right but we live in a society right now where someone like me who has worked, uh, who is, who has gone to the gym five to seven days a week for 25 straight years, who eats insanely healthy, all organic, um, you know, all clean, everything like that. Right. I meditate twice a day. Um, I take time out and I go to therapy, uh, with a therapist because my brain health is just as important as my physical mm -hmm. health. Uh, I try to get, uh, I wear an aura ring. So I'm measuring my sleep. So I get good sleep every night. And I have spent a shit ton of money in order to put my health as a priority in my life. And now someone like me, if I were not to take the vaccine, is the outcast of society. Yeah. I see plenty of people right now going to Europe right now who are overweight, 
and never done anything, you know, don't do anything to improve their health or their conditioning. And they're the ones that are told in society, hey, you get to have free reign over anything you want. And by the way, I'm not opposed to them having free reign, but I think we're starting to put people in silos and we're starting to, um, we're starting to create divisions like I've never seen in this country right now. And I'm, I'm worried about it. Yeah, I, th- and then, I think, the- you know, part of people say, how can you work in politics, those evil MFers and all this stuff? And I'm like, well, that's the system we have. And I got all I can do is be in the arena, you know, man in the arena by, by Teddy Roosevelt, the quote, if you don't know it, go look it up. And all I can tell you is my charge is I got to do what I can do. And so I don't sit on the sideline and bitch and complain about politics. I'm in the fight. Yeah. Um, I'm in the fight every day. And we are doing, God, we're doing, you know, 20 huge races, political races next year, U.S. Senate races, governor's races, congressional races. I'm fighting like hell uh, to keep the freedoms in this country. And I'm just going to do my part. And like I said, I'm not the one spearheading this. I'm just one part of it. And that's, uh, I guess that's the rabbit hole you wanted us to go down. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's really concerning uh, for someone like myself, who is very similar in political beliefs as it relates to more libertarian leaning, Mm -hmm. is the the lack of freedom of speech like that we're experiencing. The the fact that um, I either have to bleep out some of your words or like do something different on YouTube, like we will see a difference as it relates to this video. Um, it's insane. Mm-hmm. It's literally insane. And it almost like drives the, like the, I think paranoia. Well, you can't even put under- what I just said up on YouTube or you're gonna get taken down. Yeah, it, it's, just, it's just one of those things where like you look at China, you look at North Korea, now that we're already, this, this, uh, this is just a lost cause, this episode. Like you look at those countries and you're like, man, like, um, that's horrible what they're doing. And yet, I can't say certain things. Otherwise, I will get banned or shadow banned or taken. Sure. That's I mean, we have the Uyghurs in China who are enslaved right now, enslaved Muslims. And you're the enemy of this country right now. Yeah. And what, but we're still utilizing all the products that these the slave labor is bringing into this country. The NBA has a direct affiliation with the slave labor market that's going on right now. And only Enos Cantor is speaking out only one person. He's, he's more about Turkey, but he's also speaking out about China. No one else is. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's a really weird society. There's a, a, there's a lot of uh, contradictions yeah. and there's a lot of hypocrisy. And I guess where my political beliefs have come from is trying to be consistent Um and what I believed in and what I believe in, that doesn't mean I can't evolve, yeah. but it also means if I say, you know, uh, you know, my body, my choice, if, if that was, you know, the pro-choice movement's position for the last 50 years, and now they're advocating that it's, you, you either take a vax or you can't be part of society. So it's not your body, not your choice anymore. That's a contradiction that, no one can seem to explain and no one has to defend themselves on it. And that's really shocking to me. Yeah. So, so, so many other things that I want to say, but we're going to move on. Um, did you, ha- did, were you involved in, in Donald Trump's camp, the second, second presidential campaign? No, we had the chance to, we just had too much other work. It was, uh, uh, I, I was doing more corporate work and we just decided that uh, we were, we, we passed on 2020. So we did, ob- we did work in 2016. Obviously, it's easy to have opinions in my comfy little house. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just I just see like, I, obviously, the Twitter was like something that I think helped him get elected because mm-hmm. it, it I had some friends that were not interested in politics mm-hmm. and they became so passionately for Trump. Like it was unbelievable. And so I saw like that he rallied a group like I, I went out to a conservative um, event just earlier this year. And I mean, Trump everywhere kind of deal. And so it was like, there's definitely people that are super rallied up, like love, love the guy. I also felt like he's, he put his foot in his mouth every other day. And, and so do you think like he lost on that or can you point to why he got elected number one and then why you think he lost and, and you can say whatever you want to say, cause there's, there's opinions on if he lost kind of deal, but what is your thoughts on just the whole election in general? So a couple of things. 
the data leading into the election said that the American people wanted the chaos to stop. And so you have to remember, though, Donald Trump ended up getting something like 10 or 20 million more votes than he did the first time around. So he brought new voters, even though everybody knew who he was and they were tired of all the chaos. But it motivated enough people outside of that for him to, to lose. Now, the question and, and again, they just said, I mean, this is why Biden hid in the basement. The, the, the data that we were looking at was very clear. Just let's just calm down and make this go away. Now, nothing's gone away. COVID's worse than it was before the vaccination and all that stuff, right? They chose wrong, right? But that's the choice they had at the time. And that's the choice they made. And the reason they hid Biden in the basement was they knew if Trump didn't have an opponent to beat up all the time, that he would just continue to throw out things and and create more chaos. And that was going to drive and help Biden. And that's why he hid in the basement and didn't do anything. Now, the question is, was there fraud or cheating on election day? So my belief is this, um, no, but I do believe the, the election was rigged. And I think the election was rigged well before election day. I believe that the, when you when you had all the voting um, opportunities that, you know, the in-person voting or the, the mail, mail-in voting, when you had um, Mark Zuckerberg putting half a billion dollars into only high, strong democratic uh, uh, urban areas to get out the vote. Um, there were, you know, when you have a media that's blocking Hunter Biden stories and every other story and they're banning certain voices, um, that's where I think the rigging actually happened. Did the rigging actually happen on election day where thousands or millions of votes were, were being switched or turned off? I don't believe that. That's just how I believe. I believe the, the election was rigged by the media. It was rigged by the Democratic politicians. There was a they came together uh, to create the the mail by votes and to to uh, silence voices and silence stories that would have hurt Joe Biden. But on election day itself, of course, there's always fraud on election day. I've been in. I can tell you a thousand stories where I'm like, I know that cheating went on in that district or whatever. Yeah. Is it enough to overturn an election, a presidential election, even one that was the basically one of the closest in the history of American politics? And the answer is no. Yeah. Again, uh, so so many questions. I, I really appreciate you speaking freely. Um, thank sure. you, thank you for that. And I'm I'm fascinated by your data-based answer because i uh, i think there's a lot of truth to that it's like joe the less joe biden said the better he did um because the more he talked i think the less the worse he did sure they knew uh, that they knew he'd come out and, and and look at what he's doing right now as president like when he can't complete sentences and and he he's having to read from a teleprompter and then he like you know reads quote unquote because he can't decipher or d- yeah. differentiate between what the teleprompter is saying I'm not making a joke. Like people now see what it is. The reason he's the most unpopular president in American history right now at where he is, uh, is precisely why they hit him so that they could win and get him in office. Yeah. And, and you're saying if you were to give Trump advice, hindsight 2020, you would have told like with that data, do you think Trump would have done anything? No, I mean, you, this is what I always try to tell people like, they go, if he just didn't tweet as much, I go, hold on. You're trying to tell me that he's going to change who he is. No, the reason he won was because he is who he is. That's his authenticity. That's who he is. So stop trying to tell me if he just tweeted less, he would have won. No, like I get that. You don't get to to make that assumption because that never was in play to begin with. He is who he is like him or hate him or yep. just be in the middle of the road. You have to make a decision. He ain't changing. That is yep. who he is. Is he going to run again in 2024? Uh, good question. I have no, who knows? Like, I mean, you know, who, ever, anybody tell you right now, one way or the other is they really don't know. They're just making headlines. Got it's it. kind of like in the 22, the 2022 elections, the fall elections, right? I get this every day. Well, what's going to happen? Republicans going to take over. I said, well, if the election were today, they would, but the election ain't yeah. today. Yeah. It's a lot of things that can happen. I don't know what can happen. Yep. I will monitor and be watching the data from, you know, basically now all the way until election day. I'll have a much more concise answer in the fall, yep. uh, maybe late summer and then in fall. And then about two weeks to go, I'll have a really good answer. And if something doesn't pop up, 
yep. that we didn't expect, then, you know, I'll pretty much be spot on. But other than that, I don't from, know. from an intuition standpoint, I think Roe v. Way, depending on the timing of when that comes out and what what happens, I think that could that could be very interesting and get a, a group of voters that we're not going to vote ra like rallied up. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. Is there we'll any see. other factors that you're looking at as it relates to data right now? I mean, it's it's all about the freedoms and lockdowns, and yeah. you know um, that that's what you're saying. I mean, w why are the the states? You know, I mean, you can see this: the states where people are moving out of the most are the ones yep. with the most restrictions. Then people, the states that have had the most influx of people are the most freedom state. I'm in Florida. Like I moved, uh, I, I lived in Washington D.C. for 17 years. I paid those ridiculous taxes, and I did it because I didn't have kids, or I didn't have a kid. Um, and my wife and I had a lot of fun living in the city and it is a great city. I still own a home in Washington, DC, although I'm not allowed to go back right now. And I wasn't allowed to go back during the first year of COVID because, you know, couldn't, nothing was open. Um, I've seen the politicians in that city destroy that city. But in 2014, I went, hold on, I'm paying 10% in city income tax on top of federal taxes. Why it, you can't send your kids to public school in, in DC? I mean, you can. You, you most people, if they have the option, are going to go private, right? Yep. And, and you're like, what am I paying all these taxes for? Like, this is insane. They don't want me here. I wrote to my subscribers a couple of years ago that the and you'll probably like this. You should go look it up. But the power of incentives, and it, there was no incentive to be in Washington DC. My daughter was about a year year old, and we went. This doesn't work anymore. And I said, oh, there's a state that wants me. It's called Florida. There's no yep. taxes in Florida. Yep. So in 2014, um, we we packed our bags. We uh, set up our businesses down here. We moved down here permanently. And when the pandemic hit, thank God almighty, I live in freedom right now. And I can honestly say where I live in Florida, the mask mandate was removed in July of 2020. 2020, my daughter went to school in person in August of 2020 and has not stopped since. The, Thank God, you know, I got lucky. I chose, I, again, I used my common sense and my common sense sort of guided me to the right place. I love it, man. I, I appreciate you articulating that. It's, I, I currently live in Colorado and the three states that um, my wife and I are looking to move all happen to be 0% um, income tax sure. states that all happen to be red. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, uh, let's I get it. Let's talk about let's talk about marketing. Um, sure. One of my favorite marketing books is um, The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes, mm -hmm. and I love when he talks about market data. And he just he made me come alive three four years ago, and just made me like have this like hunger and thirst for like how wh how can I communicate in such a way if I truly believe in what I'm what I'm doing is going to better someone's life. I have a moral obligation to communicate in a way that it transfers. What I love about in in what you're doing and just doing research and I and I purchased your book is like yes. I want to learn more of that. And so yeah. with the few minutes that we have left, what what framework can someone who may or may not have a business, what framework can someone get that can translate into no, number one helping them be more wealthy, but then as a business owner, as someone that wants to make more money, wants to have a bigger impact, what would you tell them? Um, and it might be two totally separate answers, but I'm more curious, someone who's accomplished so much, who's living an intentional life, in these last couple of minutes that we have, what kind of advice, what kind of frameworks can, can my audience have that can help us live more intentionally and show up more powerfully? So I'll start it by this, Caleb. Um, in about two days, we're moving into our forever home. So I've, in the last 30 years, I've moved 19 times. And for the last two years, we bought some property literally February before COVID hit. And I went, oh, I mean, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. You know, um, thank God I did it because I couldn't afford the property now. But we built a house on the water in Florida and we move in in two days. And over the last two years, we've lived in a rental home. And the rental home is part of this conglomerate neighborhood with all these houses that are built. Um, and they're just all the same. Right. And it, it reminded me when you asked me that question of that, the question is, do you want to build a house that'll be built in three months? And you have, it doesn't cost much. It has some shoddy labor on it. Um, 
you didn't, you know, you got cheap fixtures, you got cheap studs in the house, um, but you can get in. And, but if a hurricane, category five hurricane hits where I am right now, that house will be gone. Or do you want to spend money doing it the right way, making sure that you've got it everything in order, that everything is done to code, that everything is built the right way, that you have the right wood in the background, that it's properly treated, that you do all the foundational things first. You know, um, our house is built on a foundation with 79 telephone pole pilings and it's built nine feet high and it's not on piling. Like it's not on, like, it doesn't look like a tree house. It's a foundation. That's nine feet. That's how, how, you know, solid the foundation is. It's concrete and dirt for nine feet with 79 pilings underneath it as well. And that was not an easy choice to make. And my loan is a thousand times more expensive, but I'm going to have a forever home. And in 15 years, you're going to ask the question, should, did, what would, if I could look back 15 years from, you know, in 15 years, what, how would I want this house to be built? It's kind of like your your financial portfolio. How do you want to build it? Do you want to go after the cheap and the quick and the things that you think, uh, look, I love NFTs. I'm not opposed to NFTs, but if you don't know NFTs and you're just buying into NFTs and you're buying into every coin out there in crypto, and I love crypto, I have cryptos. I'm not against any of that. But if you don't understand it and you're going for the get rich quick scheme or pill, you're going to lose every time. If you're going to build the get rich uh, get into a house quick and cheap, you're going to lose eventually, right? It's the foundation you want to build it on. So really what I built is a marketing agency that utilizes, like I said, a money ball approach. You know, when I was uh, looking up, you know, your stuff and, and studying who you are, you know, you have this financial x-ray that you put out, Caleb, right? And I started laughing because my five-step marketing formula is very similar. So the first thing we do in the way we market a business is we have to do the first thing. It is the most important. We have to do a deep dive into the customer data or client data of that business owner, financial advisor, whoever it is. And we need to know who their investors are, who their customers are, who their clients are. Wouldn't you want to know with certainty what they cared about, what moved them? So when you talk to them, when you sell to them, when you want to push your product out to them, that you are meeting their needs, that you're unique and relevant in, from their perspective, not whatever you think it is. And so I have a partnership. But I mean, I'm so dedicated to this that I have a partnership with the largest data collection analytics and AI company in America. And I have a, in my database, I have 240 million American consumers. 550 million plus connected devices. I'm tracking 10 billion with a B, 10 billion online purchasing decisions every day and a trillion searches. So if you have a, you know, we've done this for Fortune 200 companies. We've done this for startups, small businesses. We've done this for financial advisors. We've done this for everybody. We can look at their, their lists, overlay them online and track the movements of these people online. And then I can spit out a report that tells you the top social media platforms they are in a chronological order. So if you were like, well, we're running a bunch of things on Facebook and I'm like, but your customers or your investors, they're not on Facebook. Why would you spend any time there? Right. Uh, I can tell you the top three values in the lives of your customers, investors or clients. Top three values. Imagine if I could, if you knew what moved them, what their values are in their life. I can tell you. I can tell you what they watch specifically, the TV shows. I can tell you the magazines and the newspapers they read, the online publications they read specifically in an order. Um, and I can literally play Moneyball with any uh, target market of any business owner out there. And like, you know, we've done this, we're doing this for very, very, very well-known people right now that if I said, uh, on this podcast, you'd be like, oh my God, really? Um, but we have done this over and over again. And the reason being is that I won't work with anybody that doesn't undergo this first step, just like with your financial x-ray, it's gather the data. It's the same thing. And if someone says to me, ah, I don't want to gather that data. I don't want to, 
you know, I don't want to uh, look at, at my customer or my investor base. I, I know what people like. I know I built this thing. And I'm like, you could have built it two times bigger if you knew what they cared about and you messaged and branded your content to, in the way they wanted to receive it, not in the way you just want to talk about yeah. it, right? And so I won't work with anybody that doesn't undergo a deep dive into the data of their investors, customers, or clients. That's step one. And then step two for me is now that we've done that, right? Uh, we've looked at all that data, you have to build a plan. I mean, you, I think you even call it build your model. Well, we build a strategic plan. And the strategic plan is so important because here's the deal. You need to marry your outcomes, your vision of your company or your business, and you need to marry it with where the customers, the clients, the investors are. Yep. Those two things. Hey, like I said earlier, you know, if you have a big budget, you need to marry that. Where, are the, where am I going to spend money? Well, you should probably spend money where your customers are, not yeah. where you think they are. Yeah. And, right? you know, what is your target market? What if I told you it was different than you thought? What if that means you've been doing really good in a non-target market now that you could put this on steroids if I could tell you the exact marketplace that wants to hear your message? Right. So the allocation of budget dollars, timelines, a messaging, brand, all that needs to come in a plan, just like you have a business plan in your life, right? You don't start a business and just guess you have a business plan. Well, you should have a marketing plan and it should be reflective of what your vision is, the business owner and what the customer wants or the investor wants. And here's another way of explaining it. We love to tell our founder's story. I'm sure you're no different and I am no different. I tell my founder's story all the time, right? But what if you knew with certainty that your investors, customers, or clients only cared about 25% of your story. Yeah. Would you continue to tell the 75% they don't care about, or would you take that 25% and optimize it, put it on steroids and make it even better? Yeah, absolutely. Because that's what's going to convert more customers or clients or whatever you're looking for. So for us, step two is to look at the strategic plan. Step three is you got to go build your brand now. You never build your brand um, ever right? Um, unless you know what your customers want. It's like, um, why, would I, why would I advertise for a politician, right, to voters? If the voter goes to that politician's website because they saw our ad and they were intrigued and it, the website doesn't speak to them, the issues they care about aren't on their website, uh, they're, you know, they don't get a picture of the family, which I mean, we found out in the data they cared about, like, what is the family like? Like, if you don't know your brand, if you're, you know, a lot of marketing agencies, Caleb, they will sit around with a client and they'll be like, Caleb, oh, we're going to build this brand. We sat around a, our conference room table and, and we thought about your brand and this is what it looks like. And you go, well, what was that based on? And they go, I don't know. We felt like it. Well, we don't live in a society like that. In fact, Forbes has a stat out right now that we are seeing up to 10,000 ads a day online and offline. Every one of us, 10,000. No offense, no offense to you, no offense to me. We're not special. Unless you're sticking out from the crowd, unless you're breaking through a 10,000 in ads a day world. And by the way, it's not 10,000 of your own competition. It's everything. It's shoe companies, it's hair care companies, it's clothing companies, it's everything. You're competing for attention. You're competing for attention. And unless you know how to break through all that clutter, by resonating strong, more strongly with your customers, clients, or investors, you're never going to win ever. It's kind of like going to a casino and going, man, I'm walking, I, I got hundred dollars in my pocket and I'm going to walk out of here in a limo. And then about 20 minutes later, you have no more money left. Yeah. The casino is the big tech companies. The casino uh, are, the, are, the, are the people that take your money, the, the Facebook company, the Google, everybody, they, they take your money regardless. They don't care if you make any money on your marketing or ad dollars or not. They take it anyway. They're the casino. And you may hit a good hand every once in a while, but more often than not, you're going to lose. That's why people, the casinos always make money because the odds are always in their favor. And so my point is you have to get those three steps right, right away, right? The fourth step for us is you have to go test your message. Okay. And the way we do this is we take all the things we found in that data and we go test the most important messages we found in there. Well, I'll give you an example because you asked about the Trump stuff. So in 2016, I didn't do this for Trump, but I know Trump's uh, marketing team and they told me this like right after the election. They, they followed this five-step formula to win in 2016, right? 
And when they got to step four, which was the testing phase, they knew a certain message would work, but they didn't know what part of it would work. So they would test one message, one message, 162 ways or versions on Facebook. Crazy. They would have one message and they would do, um, they would create one message with a blue background, a red background, a man in the head, a woman in the head, different font sizes, the font, fonts and uh, the type in one corner and another corner. And ultimately after 162 versions, they would find eight or nine that blew through the roof and they didn't know why, but they didn't have to put a lot of money down to figure that out. And once they did test and they did find these eight or nine, they went, now that we know what works, kind of like your diagnosis, right? Now that we know what works, now we're going to go out and market to those messages that we have certainty with. And that's what wins. And so when we started doing this for businesses, the same approach, we grew every single one of them. Every single business we worked with that has followed our five-step system. The fifth step is you launch your, your marketing campaign with the fifth step because you've eliminated all your risk, just like investing. You eliminate the risk every step of the way to give you the best shot at, at making the most money. It's the same thing here. And that's what we do for businesses. That's the playbook is my book. Uh, if you haven't read it yet, Caleb, I tell you, go read it because it's got all a ton of political war stories. So you'll be <laughs> highly entertained. I promise. I, I, I can't um, wait. Is the audible if you like version, politics it, or you're interested in politics? Trust me, this is a business book that tells political war stories like you wouldn't believe. I tell the story about a marketing campaign we did in 2018 for Ron DeSantis' uh, governor's race against Andrew Gillum. You don't think uh, elections have consequences? Um, Ron DeSantis won that election out of like six, seven million votes. He won by 30,000 votes. And the Wall Street Journal said the ads that we ran were the difference in the whole election. Now, Andrew Gillum has been caught uh, with prostitutes smoking meth a, a year later after he lost that race. So, and then COVID hit. So you don't think uh, you know, elections have consequences. Yeah. Well, I tell you the story in the book of how we did it, how we followed this formula and, and helped Ron DeSantis get elected. I, again, I didn't get him elected. I helped get him elected. And, um, and then I apply it to how businesses should be doing this as well. I, I think there's a good chance that Ron DeSantis will be a future president of the United States. Who knows? Uh, may, maybe not, but it's definitely, he's definitely trending in the right direction. And yep has a base that very much passionately likes what he's up to. Um, man, I really appreciate you taking time to articulate this. I, I just, there's so many correlations, whether you're a business owner or not, like if you're a consumer investing, what do you need to have before you jump in? The data. And so it's like, it's one of those things where I can't tell you how many people, whatever they do, they're not data um, driven. And that's where some of our biggest mistakes have been made because my intuition's wrong more than it's right. And um, we have not done a great job with marketing and, and just st strategy in general, um, being data driven. And the more we've, we've been turned on to that, uh, the better we've gotten and the less emotion you need to put into something because, uh, you know, data might not care about your feelings. So no, it doesn't. Um, one of the last questions I want to ask as we're wrapping this up is what I call the legacy question. Um, I know you have a personal war story as well, um, but the legacy question goes like this. If this is your last day on earth and you're with the people that you love the most and you can't give them your book, you can't give them any interviews, I hope they and only, you only have book, one yeah. conversation. <laughs> yeah. What would you make sure that that conversation highlights and, and who would it be and, and what would you say? Oh, I mean, it'd be, you know, to, to my daughter and um, the bottom line is all success in life comes to whether you love yourself first. And I didn't love myself first for I'm 47 for 46 years. And everything has changed in my life in the last year since. And, and you know, it's the silver lining of, of COVID and all this stupid stuff that's going on in the world is that I had to stop reacting and stop following and i had to figure out i had to follow my own heart and my own what who i really was and it's dra dramatically changed my life and it's something I, I i i had to work on every single day but i can't love my family and i can't be the best leader in my business unless i love my myself first
That's the bottom line. If I love who I am and I'm comfortable with who I am, then I'm a more loving father, husband, business leader, entrepreneur, all of those things that all fall on. If I don't, if I'm inauthentic to who I am and I'm just following and trying to do a bunch of things that I think I'm supposed to do, I come off as inauthentic and people can read that a mile away. And it is something I've struggled with my whole life. Um, I had a, we had a massive event in one of my businesses uh, about a year ago, turned it around and, and I've got about four or five different companies, but um, it, it forced me because here's the thing. And you know, this Caleb and it's, you can apply this to financial investing or anything. People don't make change until the pain is too big. Totally. Why does everybody sell when the market's going down instead of buying when the market's going down? It's the same thing. Right. And so um, I hit a point last year where a lot of things came at me at one time and um, I had to figure that out. And what I figured out was I didn't love myself very much. And so I had to figure that out. And so whether it's my daughter or whether it's anybody, it's just always make sure you know who you are and be true to that and everything else will fall in, will fall in the right way. And what's, what's so special is your, your example of building a strong foundation uh, speaks so perfectly to what you just talked about and is loving, loving thyself and knowing that that has to be at the core because at the end of the day, a solid foundation, you're able to build a lot and endure a lot with a solid foundation and people that um, don't take the time to really, really go deep um, might have an impressive outside of the building, but are very vulnerable. And so thank you for that. Um, how can people connect with you? I know for business owners, for financial advisors that yeah. want to learn more about your five step. Yeah. Um, you know. yeah. We've helped a lot of financial advisors. If, if, if you're interested in understanding, let's say your investors better or your customers or clients better, we do have a free data assessment on our website. It's philipstutz.com slash insights. I'm sure you'll have that in the show notes. Um, it takes literally 30 seconds to fill it out, but my team will do a, a 30 minute free call with you and they'll walk through whatever data you have and show you how it work in our system. It doesn't cost you anything. It's absolutely free. And usually you get one of my top data guys that does it because they like doing those calls. So uh, pretty cool there. You can you know, buy my book anywhere. And then, you know, I write a subscriber newsletter uh, right every two weeks. Um, and that is at philipstutz.com. You can just go to, to my blog and sign up there. And then I have the Undefeated Marketing Podcast. So if you want to learn more sort of about my vision and marketing and you want to get it free uh, tactics, free tips, um, again, you know, like I say, I, I write, I podcast and I got a book that costs eight bucks. So there's a lot of free stuff you can get out there with me right now. And it's drastically going to improve what you do in your business. I love it. We will include all of those in the show notes. Um, if, if YouTube takes us down, go to the podcast. <laughs> we'll have it both there as well. Uh, Philip, I'm grateful for you and I'm, I'm grateful for you taking the time to be on the show. Yeah, thanks. It's an honor to be here, man. Thanks for what you're doing and uh, keep up the good work.